بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ناؤ دس از دی نیو انادر ڈیفیکلٹ ایم سی کیوز ویڈیو دس از دا سیکنڈ ویڈیو اینڈ دس از فار دا جون ٹوینٹی ون پیپر ون ٹو اینڈ آئی ہیو سلیکٹیڈ سم آف دا کوشچن وچ آر چیلنجنگ اینڈ آئی ایم گوئنگ ٹو ہیلپ یو ٹو انڈرسٹینڈ دم دس از دا ویڈیو ٹو آن دی ایم سی کیوز وچ آر ڈیفیکلٹ ایم سی کیوز I have picked up these questions from the exam report which says that these were challenging questions. So the first question which is challenging is which row is correct? Now, and many of you selected option A. So what is the concept which is wrong in option A is that a cell, a chloroplast is not a cell. Yes, a red blood cell, this is correct. Neuron is correct. Sap vacuole is also not a cell. So how are you confusing the chloroplast? Now, if you look at this diagram, this diagram helps you to uh, revise what we've just uh, been doing, is that this is a plant cell and the chloroplast is just an organelle inside a plant cell. And this is another chloroplast here. Similarly, we've got mitochondria, which are organelles, but they're not cells. They are organelles. And then this is the nucleus. And then the nucleus has the nucleolus in it. So just a quick re re revision of it, and of course this is the cell membrane which is also called the plasma membrane and then you have a very thick cell wall which is this thick cell wall which is quite many times thicker than the cell membrane, in fact 500 times thicker than the cell membrane. So the answer to question 1 was D. Why was it D? Because neuron is a cell. Vascular bundle is made up of xylem, phloem, so it's got, it's a tissue. Then a leaf is an organ in a plant because it's made up of so many tissues. And then an organ system is an excretory system. So in fact, all these, if you look at all these, digestive system was correct, nervous system was correct, but liver was wrong. Why? Liver is an organ. It's not an organ system. Now in this, of course, we have to understand is organs were liver is an organ, blood is a tissue, stomach is an organ, leaf is an organ. Tissues, we had red, uh, mesophyll, red blood cell is not a tissue, sap vacuole, no, vascular bundle is a tissue. So this is what we have to understand is how we have to differentiate between cell, tissue, organ and organ system. Question 14, the diagram shows how the volume of blood, volume of blood in the left ventricle. So this is the heart. This is the right side of the heart, right atrium. This is the left atrium. This is the right ventricle, this is the left ventricle. Now you know that there is a bicuspid valve here. So it says, diagram shows the volume of blood in the left ventricle of human heart changes during one heartbeat. When is the left ventricle contracting? You see, if the left ventricle is contracting, the muscle in the wall of the left ventricle is contracting, then the blood has to flow into the aorta. So the volume will decrease. As blood flows from the left ventricle into the aorta, the volume is going to decrease. This is where you are going to see. Here is the volume of blood. So the volume of blood was 70 here. And then the volume of blood is decreasing. So that is the time. So that is why the answer was B. Now coming to question number 22. What happens in the eye to produce the pupil reflex to bright light? You see, you've got to understand is that there are two different things. One is near and distant vision, which is accommodation. And one is the pupil reflex, which is in your syllabus. So if you look at the iris of the eye, so this is the iris which I'm drawing in green, it has circular muscles of the iris. And inside here, what do we have? We have the pupil, which is an actually an aperture, a hole, which is of course looks dark and black because there's no light inside, so you see it dark. And then you have the circular muscles of the iris, which I've drawn in green. So this would be the circular muscle of the iris. And of course, these would be the radial muscles of the iris. So the radial muscles of the iris. Now you've got to be clear, we're talking of the iris. Circular muscles and radial muscles of the iris. So what happens to the eye to produce the pupil reflex to bright light? Now what are the options available to us? Ciliary muscle contracts. Now ciliary muscle contracts, this is only for accommodation. This is not in the pupil reflex. Ciliary muscle. They are different muscles. I just said circular muscles of the iris and radial muscles of the iris. So circular muscles contract, yes, this would be correct. Radial muscles relax. Why? Because if it is bright light, then the pupil will become smaller in diameter. So we say the pupil constricts. And suspensory ligaments again with accommodation 
So that is why the answer was C, it was only 2 and 3. But why are they wrong is because this ciliary muscle story and the suspensory ligament story are for near and distant vision. They are for near and distant vision and we talk of accommodation. Then question 4 seemed to be a little difficult for some students. Which word describes an enzyme that has its active site changed by high temperature? You see this is an enzyme, this is the active site. The active site is the depression. So this would be the active site. So this would be the active site which is the depression, not the rest of the enzyme. But when we say we, if we boil enzymes then the active site loses its shape. So the active site will lose its shape. Now the substrate no longer fits, but what is the word used for this? The word used for this is denatured. So we don't use the word destroyed or deleted or distorted or something. It's a technical biological term which we say is denatured. Then coming to question 27, which microorganism are involved in the decomposition of dead plant material? Now of course we've given three options, bacteria, fungi and viruses. But the only answer to that was, of course, you've got to understand is viruses have no role to play in decomposition. We only talk of bacteria and fungi. So bacteria and fungi only, so the answer would be B. So this is something which we must know that, you know, dead plant matter is decomposed by bacteria and fungi, but not by viruses. You see, viruses live on another living organism. That's why they're called total parasites, because they have to have another host cell which is living and they have to use the uh, machinery of the host cell, they have to use the ribosomes, they have to use all the enzymes of the living cell. So dead matter, they cannot actually survive on that. So viruses have to survive on another living host cell. Now coming to question 30, 30 which is a famous carbon cycle question. If you look at the videos on which I posted the text, the diagram shows part of the carbon cycle. There are only three processes. And it's very easy to understand these processes if you think that how carbon dioxide is going to be returned to the atmosphere. It's going to be returned to process of respiration. Respiration by everything, plant, animals, bacteria, everything, combustion and decomposition. Now, in decomposition, there is also the microorganisms are respiring, but this is on dead matter. Like if you and me are respiring, then that carbon dioxide is also removed to the atmosphere. But that is not decomposition. Decomposition is the bacteria and fungi respiring and returning the carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So green plants, now you can see this arrow coming out of carbon dioxide and going to green plants. Now this has to be photosynthesis. There is only one process which uses carbon in the form of carbon dioxide and that has to be photosynthesis. So X has to be photosynthesis. So it could only be C or D. Then we know that the green plants respire and this is going to be returned to the atmosphere. The carbon dioxide is returned to the atmosphere. So this would be respiration. So we look at where there is respiration. And then Z is fossilization to carbon dioxide. So it is this arrow, fossilization to carbon dioxide in the air. So this has to be combustion. It can't be anything else. Fossilization means fossil fuels are burnt in cars, aeroplanes. And then of course the carbon dioxide is returned to the atmosphere. So that is why the answer had to be C and it couldn't be the other ones. Then question number 35, the diagram shows how the blood of a human fetus flows close to the mother's blood in the placenta. So the mother's blood is here. Let's color that. So this is the mother's blood here. And then we are seeing the blood of the fetus and then this we are seeing this blood of the fetus. Let me give it another color. So this is the blood of the fetus which is going here and the fetus is somewhere here and this would be the umbilical cord. So now what is X and what is Y? Now X is returning blood to the placenta. So X has to be the umbilical artery and the umbilical artery is carrying the deoxygenated blood because it's going towards the placenta. So it is carrying deoxygenated blood from the fetus to the placenta. While on the other side we've got Y. Now Y is the one which is carrying oxygenated blood and this is the umbilical vein. This is the umbilical vein and this is carrying oxygenated blood to the fetus. Now the question they are asking you is which substance are present in X in a higher concentration than Y. 
so in a higher concentration than y we have to understand will be carbon dioxide and urea why because the fetal cells are aspiring and producing carbon dioxide and urea so they will be in a higher concentration the question is higher concentration so there will be more carbon dioxide and of course more urea because the uh, fetal kidneys are also producing urea so glucose and oxygen would of course be more in the one which is carrying the blood to the fetus so that will be the umbilical vein and carbon dioxide and glucose well that is not sort of doesn't fit anywhere and glucose and urea also doesn't fit anywhere so the mother's blood is on one side and the fetal blood is on one side because they cannot come in contact because the mother and the fetus can have different blood groups but only there is that is why the function of the placenta is only the exchange of nutrients so from the mother's blood glucose and oxygen and amino acids and fats are going to cross into the fetal blood and then the fetus is going to use that to grow because remember the fetus is because not eating anything so it's not eating and digesting and all that so it has to get all its nutrients from the mother's blood so this is how you have to understand this question and the answer to this was b then coming on to question number 36 the table shows four ways in which diseases may be passed from one human to another which row shows the ways in which hiv may be transferred now hiv is a virus and it can only be transferred it cannot be transferred by air like sneezing or uh, by coughing and that's uh, we don't study any diseases like that in the o levels we do it in the a levels so the fact is that there has to be mixing of the body fluids so the only answer is it can only pass through blood and semen so the answer was d so air and saliva is wrong saliva cannot contain because it the virus is in your blood so the blood vessels have somehow got to break and the blood to blood the body fluids must come in contact from from one person the person who is infected to an uninfected person now coming to question number 37 which sex chromosomes are present in every sperm cell now here there is slight uh, clarity we must make so this is a male and this is a female now a male cell and a female cell are both the same the 22 chromosomes are both the same the 22 pairs these are called autosomes or body chromosomes so they are the same but then in the male there is one chromosome which is the lengthier longer and one shorter the longer one is called x and the shorter one is called y but in the women the both are the same size same size in length i mean same in length so they are both called xx now the question was which sex chromosome are present in every sperm cell so you know when the sperms are made in a male there will be two types of sperm there will be one sperm with an x chromosome and there will be one sperm with a y chromosome which of course if a man has 5 million sperms 2.5 million will carry the x chromosome and 2 by 5 million will carry the y chromosome so which sex chromosomes are present in every sperm cell so you have two types of sperms so naturally then of course if you have understood this you can understand it can either be an x or a y chromosome only in a woman of course the ovum always will have an x chromosome so the po possibility x chromosome only was wrong because you can have an x and a y y chromosome is also wrong x or y chromosome only x and y that would again be wrong you won't have both the chromosomes you have one of it because when meiosis takes place when meiosis takes place gametes are formed and gametes only have one of each pair one of each pair so gametes will only have one of each pair so if in a female cell when the ovum is formed the ovum will only have one x chromosome which one which x we don't know could be this one could be this one but in the male when the sperms are formed when the cells divide the sperms will either carry the x chromosome or the y chromosome and of course this if this y chromosome fuses with the x chromosome then the zygote has xy and that is going to be a male child but if the x and x fuse and the zygote has xx then this will develop into a female fetus and a female child then coming to question number 40 which is again on genetically engineered microorganisms some stages in the production of human insulin are listed first is genetically modified e coli bacteria grown in large fermenters 
then the gene for human insulin is inserted into the DNA of a bacterium called E. coli. The gene for human insulin is obtained from human pancreas cells. Human insulin is extracted and purified. Now the first thing which comes to you, this would be the last thing because it says in the production of human insulin. So four must come at the end. Now there are only two situations and four comes to the end. Now, first of all, what do we have to do? We have to take the gene for human insulin obtained from human pancreas cell, right? So this would be three. Then the gene for human insulin is put into bacteria. So this would be the second point. And then the third would be then you grow these in a fermenter and the fourth would be that they are extracted and purified. So that is why the answer is D. Three was first, the gene for human insulin is obtained. Then two, put them into a bacteria. Then you grow these in a fermenter and then you extract and purify the insulin and give it to patients who are suffering from diabetes so they can inject themselves in insulin. Because we have as yet not find, found any treatment. We have not got something to treat the pancreas so that it starts making its own insulin. So we inject it with insulin. Uh, thank you for watching. And uh, I'm sure if there are any comments which you want to leave and you want anything specifically to be done in these last two, three days, please let me know. And thank you for subscribing and thank you for watching.